sometimes I'm asked why, why do I spend my time looking at uh, anomalies of consciousness? And my response is, uh, when I give talks to, to groups, and whether they're technical groups or popular groups, my response is, well, why are you all here? Because oftentimes it's standing room only. And so the, the answer is that everybody's interested in these things. Who do you know who's not interested in precognition or telepathy or something? Because when it happens to an individual, there are senses that this isn't just a weird cosmic hiccup. It's something meaningful and important and interesting. So I decided that of the variety of things that I could study, this was something that was personally meaningful and, and interesting. So why wouldn't I study it? The effects that we see in random generator studies in terms of the magnitude is pretty small. Uh, but in science, the important thing is whether something exists, not necessarily what the magnitude of the effect is. Because under conventional theories, there shouldn't be any relationship at all between what's going on inside your head and what's going on outside the world. And so the fact that we can use these generators over now over half a century and see reasonably replicable evidence suggesting there's some kind of mind-matter interaction provides a major challenge to our theories about the way that we think things work. So some aspects of the magnitude of the effect being small may simply be that we don't have the right kind of detector yet. And it may also be that we don't understand what, what properties of the mind are important in order to get these effects. And I think both of those are true. So we're, we're, there may be a significant mismatch between what we think of as mind and what we think of as matter, and that's why we're getting small effects. Under a century from now, or who knows how long, we might figure out that uh, something else is a better target, something else is a better mental form of control, and that would be the perfect medium in order to demonstrate this. We might discover, for example, that the best possible mind-matter interaction that we can demonstrate is me doing this. Because we still don't understand yet why my thought, my intention, could be translated into that, but it's very reliable. So maybe that is what we're dealing with, but we don't, we don't perceive it yet in those terms. One of the inspirations for experiments in, in Psy research is to listen carefully to what people report in their daily life. And one of those effects is the feeling of being stared at, which many people can relate to, and many don't even consider to be psi. The, the phenomena is that you're sitting somewhere minding your own business, and you get an uncomfortable feeling that somebody's staring at you, you turn and you look, and sure enough, someone's staring at you. So in the laboratory, what you can do is test to see whether there may be a psi component to that. Because after all, some of it may be subliminal hearing or subliminal seeing or something like that. So uh, you, you can do one of two basic types of experiments. One where you consciously are asked to respond whether someone looking or not. And sometimes they are and sometimes they're not. You can simply do hit and miss on that kind of, of experiment. And the other one is that you wire up the person being stared at to look at their unconscious physiological uh, movements or, or physiology. Uh, during times when people are staring at them and when they're not. And both of those classes of studies show that, that people, on average, can either tell consciously or their body will indicate that they're being stared at. So this is a, an example of how, in some cases, when people report things in daily life, that it appears that there is a psych component to it because these experiments are designed in such a way to exclude all of the usual, ordinary explanations. So one could say, if you look at the preponderance of the evidence in different classes of testing psi phenomena, that it's proven. I wouldn't actually say that. I would say that in, in science, the idea is not so much proof, but degrees of confidence. So what, we, what I can say, what I'm comfortable saying, is that the degree of confidence that they have that some of these phenomena are real, some of the time, is extremely high. So it's, it's, it's like proof, except proof means absolute 100%, and that's only true for alcohol. So 
why then is this not generally recognized? Well, part of the reason is that science is fractured into so many different disciplines that no scientist working in their own discipline is, is expected to know what's happening even in, in an adjacent discipline. They just don't know. So you can't blame somebody for thinking that what they heard in college or something, that there's nothing to it, nothing to pay attention to. They will simply accept that without actually looking into the data. In cases where people are starting from a, a neutral background, where they're, they're not for or against it, they just don't know, if they are educated about it and they're brought up to speed about what's been done, invariably their interest level will rise and they won't necessarily believe it, but they'll certainly get intrigued. Because in most cases, as I said, they're, they're simply unaware that there's the data there. A second reason is that uh, you find peop some people who are very vocally against it. In most cases there too, they actually don't know the data. Their emotional response is predicated on a belief, which is not true, but nevertheless a belief that if those things were true, then everything I know must be false. And of course that's going to create a big emotional response. And it doesn't, there, you can't ra rationally argue with such people because they're not coming from a rational base. And a third case is that someone may not be very emotional about it, but they may actually believe that the world works a certain way and it's inculcated by their profession. So for example, neuroscientists working on cognition in the brain, they see every day in their work and it's, it's repeated from all of their, their colleagues and themselves that you think certain thoughts and certain areas of the brain light up and fate to complete. There, there it is. There's the correlations we're looking for. So all that's left is a little tiny mystery in how these correlates are turned into causation. This is probably pretty standard among many neuroscientists today. The problem is that that little tiny bit left over on how you turn the correlates into causation, nobody has any idea how that actually works. And if then they paid attention to this challenging data that suggests that a lot of the brain stuff is actually correct, it's not completely correct. It requires a slight extension, which means that something else about consciousness is going on which doesn't either, it actually may require the brain, we don't actually know that yet, but at least it's not locked in there. It also has effects that, that seem to spill out in some way. So what I found is, when I present this kind of data to neuroscientists, even if they're open to the idea, they'll, just, they'll be skeptical, which is fine, but they, they will say, well, this probably isn't true because it doesn't match what I know about physics. But they don't know about physics. I mean, they even admit it. They don't understand enough about physics to know that, but they somehow feel in, intuitively that it doesn't match physics. And they don't talk to physicists who will say, well, it's allowed by physics, but that doesn't match what I know about the neurosciences or biology. Well, they don't know about neurosciences and biology. And this, this is, again, part of the problem of the fracturing of disciplines that we, we can spend a lot of time working on our own discipline and, and realistically today for a working scientist knows a huge amount in very great depth about a very tiny slice. And so in a sense what I've become is a generalist. I know a fair amount about psi but I've also had to learn at least a little bit about most other disciplines. So I, I, I have some sense about at least what are the what's the dogma and the doctrines in various disciplines. And when you do that, you take this, this high-level approach across the board, you find that actually there's no incompatibilities at all. There are some challenges to existing assumptions, but they're just assumptions. Everything in science is a, an assumption. So some of the resistance is emotional, some of it is ignorance, uh, some of it is legitimate, that there, there are good questions about, well, why do you think this, and why do you think that, and there's answers to those, but nevertheless, uh, it's not as though the side business is completely wrapped up. There's many more questions and answers. Uh, so that, that's one of the reasons why it's not better accepted. Oh, and then there's another reason. Another reason is that when you talk to science journalists, who are the ones who are basically the translators between what's happening at the forefront of science and what the public then sees as credible, this, this will sound bad, and I don't mean to, uh, to offend all of the science journalists out there, but in a sense, I view many of them as failed scientists. They're, they're tr doing the translation, they know enough about it to be able to echo it, but they don't actually know the way the science works, because if they did, 
and they actually spent time to learn about what they're talking about when they're talking about Psy, they wouldn't be reporting the way that they do. So the, one of the values of an interview like what you're doing is uh, that if you talk to people who actually do know something about the topic, you're very likely to give a different response than if you talk to somebody who has an agenda in mind to say, well, no, there's nothing to it. Some scientists have a, a strong emotional response to the idea that maybe they don't understand everything. Scientists generally are pretty smart, and along with being smart or being told that your entire life, people tend to become arrogant. And when you believe that you actually understand things and are smarter than the average person, and someone comes along and says, well, you know, some of your assumptions probably aren't right, and here's some evidence that, that says that it's not right, they'll get angry. They'll, they'll respond as though they're being attacked. And so there, there's the emotional response. So when, when I gave my talk at Google, I, I do it the way I usually try to, which is I, uh, I'm interested in this, I'm spending my time doing this, but I'm not all that emotional about it. You know, it, it's interesting, it's exciting. That's where my emotion comes from. So when I present the, the results of these things, I present it in as calm and data-driven way as I possibly can. And I've heard every criticism a million times, so I, already, I know what people are going to ask if they're coming from a skeptical viewpoint. Uh, sometimes it's annoying because the questions are displaying ignorance, and I thought I just responded to gave a bunch of data which responds to something, but it, the question will indicate that they they don't they didn't hear it somehow or some other reason. So it can be annoying, but nevertheless I understand it. So the taboo persists because science, like any other human enterprise, is built on certain beliefs, and when a belief is challenged at least in public, you, you can't do that. I hear again and again from many colleagues that they're, they're fascinated by this stuff and they know they can't talk about it because if they do, their, their colleagues will roll their eyes and they won't get promoted or graduate or something. So you learn very quickly in the academic world that it's simply dangerous to talk about these things. So people don't. You've done some very interesting work demonstrating an effect often referred to as presentiment. Uh, can you briefly describe a classic presentiment experiment, its replications, and recent developments in the field, i.e. the work of Daryl Ben? Presentiment is, is a word I coined, actually I didn't coin it, the, the word has been around forever, but I, I use that word instead of precognition because uh, a lot of psi effects appear to, to be in the unconscious, and so we get fairly small although reliable effect sizes when asking people to consciously get something, but I figured that if we have ways of measuring what's happening unconsciously, we might get a bigger effect. So for precog precognition, say an unconscious version of precognition would be to effectively put somebody on a lie detector and ask them questions and see if their body knows something that their mind doesn't know yet. So this came about partially as a result of a story that a colleague told me where he was a hunter, and he was cleaning pistols in preparation for going on a hunting trip two weeks later. And he took all the bullets out of the pistols, and then he's uh, putting bullets back into his six-shot revolver, double-action six-shot revolver, which means that you pull the trigger, it rotates the cylinder, pulls the hammer back, and then it, it hits. So all in one motion, the double-action being rotating and hammer pull. So he puts six bullets out, cleans the gun, puts the six bullets in, one, two, three, four, five, and is putting in the sixth bullet and gets a really bad feeling. Doesn't like putting in that bullet. So he pays attention to his gut feeling and he doesn't put the bullet in. So he leaves it aside. And he puts the hammer over uh, the fifth chamber or the fourth chamber so that that's empty. So in case it gets jostled, it won't fire. And the next one's empty too. That's the bullet he didn't put in. So now, he's uh, two weeks later, and he's out in the hunting lodge, and after a day of hunting, uh, his pistols were not used. They'd used rifles for something, and they did what, what no one should do when there are guns around. They were all drinking. So he and his buddies are there, they're all getting somewhat drunk, and two of them get into a fight. One of them then accosts the other 
the guy who's accosted picks up my friend's gun, who happens to be there. It's loaded, it's ready to go, picks it up, points it point blank at the guy who's coming at him, pulls the trigger. Hammer goes back, cylinder turns, and it goes click, rather than bang. Actually, I, I said that slightly wrong. It wasn't that he had shot at the guy, but my friend had tried to intervene by getting in between them and had his own gun pointing right at his head, click. So at that moment, he knew where the presentiment came from. The bad feeling came from his recognition at that moment that, if, that he was about to be shot. And at that, at that second, he didn't realize that, that the bullet was taken out, but as soon as that episode was over, he realized he saved his life by paying attention to this bad feeling. So I thought, well, that would be an interesting experiment to replicate in the laboratory. But you can't put people at actual threat. So what you need to do is to have something that is emotional to, and then compare it with something that is calm in your future. And because you're doing this in a laboratory context, you can't do it two weeks in advance. You have to do it seconds in advance and do it again and again. So that's how the idea came about, where you sit somebody down in front of a computer and you measure some kind of autonomic nervous system response, like heart rate or skin conductance. And then you present them a series of pictures, some of which would be very calm and others would be very emotional. And see whether or not the body somehow knows that you unconsciously know what you're about to see. And so the emotional pictures have to be extremely emotional. It's the laboratory equivalent of having a gun shoved in your face and going, click. So, uh, that, so I ran an experiment like that, and it worked amazingly well. And I presented it at one, one of our conferences, and I remember a colleague saying, well, that, that's not possible, that's way too good. So I, fortunately, he went off and replicated it almost immediately, using the same pictures I was using and the same mechanism. So that was 96, and from then till now there have been 38 experiments of that type using physiological measures, and uh, something like 15 laboratories, many countries, and overall the results are extremely strong in the direction that I had originally seen. So this is a, a repeatable effect, it's fairly robust because most of the experiments, in fact, I think all except two or three were in the predicted direction, and many of them were statistically significant. So that's, that's a robust effect. That means what's ever going on here is actually quite a strong response. And I think be partially because it is a mimic of what happens in the real world. In addition, it's using unconscious measures as, as the indicator. You're not asking somebody to guess what's happening. In fact, if you ask people what they think is going to come up, they don't know. Some people who are very sensitive to their own physiological movements, their viscera, they do feel that their heart starts racing, they feel sweaty or something just before the very emotional picture, but most people don't feel that. So that's, that's a psychophysiological version of this type of experiment. A new class of experiments now, which might be called implicit decision making, although there are other varieties of this, they're taking standard experiments in, in cognitive psychology and in social psychology which follow a cause and effect sequence in reversing it in time. So one that Daryl Bam has, is making popular now is one of the nine experiments that he's recently published is a reversal of the mere exposure effect. And this is a phenomenon in social psychology that if you're exposed to an image again and again and again, you will prefer that image. So the way that the usual experiment works is that you, uh, you're asked to look at two pictures, both of which are equally likable, and simply decide which one do you like. And you're forced to make a decision. So normally you'd expect 50% people will prefer one versus the other. And then in fact, if there's no priming, then you will get 50%. But if you prime them, subliminally or liminally, Subliminally would be you're looking at the screen, you're seeing flashes of stuff that you don't know what it is, but it is in fact one of those two pictures, that you will then look at the two pictures and say, well, I prefer this one, but that's the one that you were primed subliminally to select, and so that's the mere exposure effect. Mere exposure meaning that you were just merely exposed to it and that, that causes you to like it. So Daryl took that idea and reversed it in time, where you start with, do you like this or do you like that, with no priming and two images that were previously selected to be, be equally likable. And you have to select one, so you select one. 
and then a random decision is made and, and one of the two pictures is primed after you made your selection. But the idea being that the priming is now in your future. And if that priming leaks back into your present, then you will prefer the image that you're about to get primed on. So that experiment was successful and a variety of other experiments along those same lines were successful. Uh, and that seems to be a fairly robust effect as well. So I recently did an analysis of all uh, psychophysiological experiments, presentiment, and these implicit decision experiments, and a couple now also using animals as targets, and I found 101, of which roughly half have been published, but half have not been published yet because they're all new, and 86 of the 101 are in the predicted direction. So it's roughly 85, 86% of these experiments are going in the direction that, you, that is predicted by some sort of a retrocausal effect. If you just take that as a, a sign test, we'd expect by chance that half of them would go in one the right direction. That's like a billion to one odds to get that many going in, in this direction. So it kind of suggests that, that we're dealing with an effect which is pretty big in an experimental sense and likely then is very big in the real world because the laboratory experiments are just mimics of what happens in the real world. And so what's happening in the real world is probably bigger in terms of, of the effects that actually occur. Most of the presentiments are designed in such a way so that you get an actual future. You see one future event. It can be redesigned, and I've done this, and there have been a few other people who have tried this as well, where you present that at the time that you're making a decision or you're waiting for a picture to appear or something like that, that the future is not determined by, by definition in the experiment, but the future is probabilistic between two targets. So we could have a very emotional target or a very calm target having different probabilities. So in one version of this, you can have an emotional target will show up at 10% probability and a calm target with 90% probability, and then a random decision is made and one of the two is shown. And so the interesting theory, thing here is not when the 90% probability event occurs, because that's kind of like the actual future, or the future that was going to happen anyway, probabilistically, but what happens when the low probability future occurs? Because then that, that allows you to look at the mismatch between the likely thing that's going to happen versus the actual thing that happens. And it allows you to then discriminate on what it is that precognition or presentiment is actually looking at. If it's looking in the clairvoyant present at probabilities or tendencies of events, then you will tend to respond to the high probability target. But if you're looking at the thing that's actually going to occur independent of its a priori probability, then you will describe the low probability but actual future. So when I've done that experiment, uh, the one time I did it, I got evidence that uh, people were tracking the more probable future, the more probable in the present future, independent of whether it actually occurred or not. Another time when I did it, using that was using conscious responses, and when another time I used unconscious responses, and that one showed that people were responding to the actual future independent of its a priori probability, including low probabilities. So I, we have ambiguous results. This is a, a not resolved question, but at least the question can be studied. And so at this point, we don't really know yet whether people are responding to the probable present or to the actual future. Now with arguably sufficient evidence for the existence of psi in some cases, where do you see the future of this research? Where do we go from now? An argument could be made that the one way of advancing the field now in sci, sci research uh, is that we, we need radical new theories to help push radical new experiments. So that's one approach, and that's viable. But I think a much more important approach is a change in what the scientific world believes is, is conceivable, because one of the good things about science is that when you put the engine of big science onto a problem, if it's at all solvable, and you throw a lot of very bright people at it, and equipment and all the rest of it, eventually things can get done. 
All kinds of things can be solved. We're dealing here with a problem which is probably with more difficult than any problem that, that science has ever faced because it involves in some way something to do with the subjective state, consciousness, subjectivity, all that stuff, which is a, a huge mystery. So while the, the approach in the past has been that you, you'd have maverick scientists who are just interested in this and doing the best that they can, the rate of progress is very slow. I think then if, if you're able to somehow magically step into an alternative world where this became a central problem and you had billions of dollars being put into this as opposed to a trickle of tiny amounts, then the rate of progress would increase. That said, of course, it's still a very difficult problem. So it may not increase very quickly, but it would sure increase a lot faster than it is now. So the next step may be to, uh, to continue to reach younger people who are not quite as admired in, in previous ideas about how things ought to work and enlighten them about the nature of the evidence. Because one thing that, that's quite clear is that when, when we talk to, you can almost separate this by age. When were you when you went to college and learned about physics or psychology? If you're probably over the age of 40, it's too late because you will have bought into the dogma of the neurosciences and what physics thinks is possible and all that. And, and you, it, you can't unlearn what you've learned. Whereas if you reach people who are less than 40 or less than 30 or some magical number, they have the advantage of learning everything that everyone else has already figured out. Plus, they haven't bought into it to the same degree. Like their careers don't depend on it, and there are lots of things don't depend on being able to regurgitate what was previously known and so new things can be developed. And the history of science shows that that's basically how all new advancements happen. It's where you, you take advantage of everything that has been known, but you, you're not constrained by both social contracts and trying to please other people, and so new things can, can break out. I, I tend not to pay too much attention to what philosophers say and the philosophy of mind, partially because my brain doesn't go there. I, I find it difficult to think about philosophy too deeply. But when I, I think about the alternatives, the brain generates consciousness versus consciousness generating everything else, I think that the evidence for psi is more along the lines of consciousness being more primary than matter or energy. And so the closest philosophical stance in that would be panpsychism, where consciousness goes all the way down. So the, the consciousness of an electron is obviously going to be very different than the consciousness of what I enjoy, but it's only a matter of scale. So I don't know what, kind, what electrons think about. Maybe they don't think at all, but maybe they have some kind of awareness, a proto-awareness. So I, find, I am sympathetic to that idea. Do you believe there may be a... Um observer-driven component to the establishment of physical reality? On alternate Tuesdays, I can accept the idea that consciousness is related to how physical reality manifests. Uh, but during the rest of the week, I, I really don't know. The, the times that I think that it is related in some way is when I look at the results of experiments where we're specifically testing some aspect of consciousness, usually intention or attention, on a physical system, and the physical system, at least in a statistical way, obeys. It changes its behavior depending on the instructions that we give. So when we look at that and we imagine that in a large scale, some aspect of reality is getting pushed around. That's not quite the same as I wish for a lamp to appear and the lamp is there, but it, it is related in the sense that the characteristics of what I perceive as a lamp might be dependent in some way on, on my attention and my intention. So I think I believe that when we leave the room that the lamp will still be there, uh, in which case consciousness is not literally creating it, but it is related to it in some way. And so this is, again, it's a little bit like the distinction between a correlation and a causation. They are correlated in some way both just from a very ordinary perceptual psychology point of view and maybe also from a side point of view. There is a relationship that's happening. The causation part, I'm not so sure about. And so I, I'm not willing to say where the arrow of, of causation is going because I don't know. But the relationship, I'm pretty sure that there is one. Thanks very much. You're welcome.